Hey everybody, it's Mom of Two, Wife of One. Thank you guys so much for coming to my channel or coming back to my channel. Before I get started, if you have never seen me before, hi, how are you doing? I'm Mom of Two, Wife of One. I'm a content creator. It's an influencer, if you will. I'm also a mommy, a wife, a writer, a literary editor, author, a woman, obviously, black woman, if you can tell, a lot of different things. But I'm here to talk about Married at First Sight, Season 17, Episode 3, which is called Hard Launch. Before I get started, make sure that you like this video, share this video, subscribe to my channel, comment below. I love getting this feedback from you guys. It means everything in the world to me. So please make sure you engage with me. And also, for the whole month of November, or as we call it in my sorority, Rovember, going to be shouting out my sorority, Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, e yep, to all my sorors. And also, today, November 6th, happens to be my birthday. So I wanted to do a video for you guys on my birthday. This is how I'm starting my birthday off. I am a proud 42 years old, very happy, very excited. So shout out also to all my Scorpios who are watching out there. So let's get started with the episode. This episode, we got the final wedding for the couple's and it was the first episode this season that we have not seen the jilted groom, Michael. I'm so happy we got a break from that because I feel for him. But it's like it don't seem fair to have him shown every week, just showing his despair and his humiliation over and over again. So we got a break from that. But we have another married couple, Cameron and Claire. I'll say this. I, for all the couples, I'm not really feeling... The, like, spark, the chemistry. Now, Claire seemed to feel it. Cameron is the guy who is from New Zealand. All of his family is there. And he basically came to, if I say Seattle, came to Denver with $500 in a suitcase. And he's staying with some family friends. And he's built a business and all this other stuff, right? He's, like, a foot taller than Claire, which I don't think I realized that until they were standing right next to each other. I was like, oh, he's a giant compared to her. To me, he seems really dry, not shy necessarily, but just really dry and awkward. But she found him hilarious and was laughing at all the stuff he was saying. I was like, oh, so I guess he's funny and that's what she needs. I didn't really see him as being funny, but what do I know? But uh, she walked down the aisle with both of her parents. He hugged her dad and he hugged, you know, he hugged his bride, his new wife. Her family said that she is genuine, compassionate and faithful and loves hard with a loud and outgoing family. That's fine. But bothered me, though, is what his friends and family had to say about him. They basically said that he likes to bike through mountains. He's tall. He has an accent and a great head of hair. And he's focused on his hobbies and his career. The whole point of that part of the ceremony, which is in the very beginning of the ceremony, they meet each other and the pastor, priest, or whoever says, Cameron, this is your wife, Claire. Claire, this is your husband, Cameron. So Claire, Cameron's family wants you to know this about him. And during that portion is when the family and friends really talk about the personality of this person. Because remember, they're strangers when they meet up at the altar. They know nothing about each other. They just learn each other's name, but they know nothing about the person in front of them. So that whole statement from the family and friends is supposed to give you a glimpse as to who they are as a person. So I thought it was very weird and interesting that all of the tidbits that Cameron's family and friends had to say was focused on his career and focused on his physical appearance. There was nothing about his personality in that whole statement. I was like, that's kind of strange. I thought that was weird. I don't know if that's an indication that he's hard to put into words or I don't know. Because for me, again, just looking at him, he seemed just really dry and just kind of boring and like doesn't seem fun, even though she found him hilarious. So I thought that was kind of weird that they didn't talk at all about who he is as a person. Is he loyal? Is he genuine? Is he funny? Is he someone who will lay down his life for his friends? Is he someone who's a wallflower? Like none of that was in their statements. I thought that was very strange. I didn't get it. One thing he did say that I thought was kind of cute, I guess, is that after they got married, they kissed at the altar like everybody else. They went outside to have their champagne. And one thing he did say to her, he's like, if all else fails, we could blame it on the experts. I was like, okay, ha ha, I guess that's supposed to be funny. And she thought it was great. Yeah, and he didn't make me laugh once, which is, you know, whatever. She finds him adorable. And he said that she's beautiful. And found out he's a dual citizen he came to the states for better opportunity and thought this was interesting when he told her that all of his family's back in new zealand he told her at some point i want us to go back to new zealand to have a second wedding i was like oh now 
I don't know what's stopping his family from coming to visit him in Denver. I don't know if it's just a financial thing. I don't know if it's something else that's preventing them from coming to visit. Um, it'd be nice to kind of get more information about that. And also, I felt like we didn't really get a glimpse or he didn't really discuss what his relationship is with his family. We know he has family there. I, I, he's an only child, I think, or maybe he has one sibling. But other than that, we didn't really like, are you, even if they're in New Zealand, are you close to that sibling? Are you close to your parents? Do you have grandparents, aunts, uncles? I didn't hear any of that. So I'm assuming that's something that'll come up later, especially because she is so family oriented. She's one of six. Her brother, you know, unfortunately passed away, but she comes from a really big family and they kept reiterating that her family is very loud and they're very protective of her. And it's a lot of them. So that is one thing that I think could possibly be concerning in the future with them is that his family being all the way over there. He hasn't been in those kind of environments where you're having, let's say, family dinners or family get-togethers. It's primarily just been him. So to now be thrust in this family where they're as close as they're making it seem, it seems like they get together pretty frequently. And I feel like, A, that might be an issue for him because it might be overwhelming for him. And B, it might be an issue for her because if he's overwhelmed by it as a wife, she needs to be like, okay, well, maybe let's not get together as often. And that could cause some issues and some friction because her family may be like, well, well, you can't change it just because you got married. But technically, things do change once you get married, right? If you're married to this man who's uncomfortable with certain aspects of your life, that doesn't mean you get rid of those aspects altogether, but it may mean you make some adjustments here and there. Maybe you don't hang out with your families five times a week. Maybe you lower it down to three so that you spend the other time with your husband. He doesn't have to come all the time. When he comes, it'll be great and wonderful, but give him that grace to sometimes bow out. So I feel like that would be an adjustment period for both of them, but we'll see how that goes. She also likes that he has hobbies because she said a man with no hobbies will cling. That is so very freaking true. If you've never heard that before, and if you are dating or looking to date someone, if that man or that woman or that person does not have hobbies, doesn't have their own friends, doesn't have like a life outside of that relationship, that is dangerous territory because all of us should have some kind of outlet, right? Love my husband to bits and pieces and he loves me as well. He is in two bowling leagues and he plays poker once a week. That ain't got nothing to do with me. That is his chill time, his relaxation time. I love that for him. I have my girlfriends. I got my sorority sisters. I have my mocha moms. I have a lot of other things that I'm doing. But we have those moments where we're together as well. But we have to have our own stuff. And we've always had our own stuff. And if you ever get with someone who either A, doesn't have their own hobbies, or B, has a problem with you having your own hobbies, those are very, very huge red flags on both fronts. So that's just a bit of advice, I guess, for you guys. So let me see what else. Okay, so I did have this question for you guys. When you have, if you have gotten married or if you're thinking about getting married, when it comes to the speech from the best man or the maid of honor or matron of honor or whoever, what kind of speech do you all prefer? Would you prefer a speech that is funny or a speech that's really heartfelt? I don't know if I have a preference necessarily. I know for me, because I'm a writer, both of my, my maid of honor, my matron of honor gave my speech in my wedding. They just did a very long speech because I'm a writer and it, it was very heartfelt and it was beautiful and it wasn't necessarily funny or goofy. And I think the best man's speech wasn't necessarily funny either, which isn't a bad thing. I think maybe I prefer heartfelt, I guess. I don't know. Cause not everybody is funny. So you wanting to write a funny speech doesn't mean it's going to come off the way you think it's going to come off. So I guess for me, I guess I answer my own question. I prefer emotional, but what do you guys prefer? You know, sound off in the comments below. And this is another thing. And I talk about this every season of Married at First Sight. When the couples get married, they obviously go to their, they have their pictures, they go to the reception, right? And then they have their first dance and they eat and they're dancing, having a good time. But then there's always a point in the wedding where the bride and the groom will separate and the bride will talk to her new in-laws or talk to the groomsmen. And the groom will go talk to the bridesmaids and occasionally talk to his new mother, father-in-law, whatever. That like always happens, right? I've always thought that's a bad idea. I know that's the chance for these family and, and family members and friends to really get to know this new person in your life. But at the same token, at a reception, especially deep into the reception, drinks have been flowing, you know, alcohol is involved. And I feel like some of the conversations and some of the questions that come up are inappropriate because everyone wants to talk about sex. 
They're like, oh, so what are your plans with my daughter tonight? And oh, are you planning to have sex with my brother tonight? That's not your business. And I probably didn't even discuss that with your brother. So why would I discuss that with you? I always think it's a bad idea. I understand why it has to happen, but I've never really liked that concept personally. Uh, they talked to her grandmother also. And her grandmother advised them not to argue, basically pick their battles and to remember that no one is perfect. Perfect advice. That's pretty much all that happened with them. Lauren and Orion. Okay. Now I'm going to skip kind of down with my notes. But the whole thing about, you know, not talking to family friends at the reception and how I kind of have an issue with that. If y'all didn't see that episode, the conversation Orion had with Lauren's daddy, her father, I like him a lot. He wasn't mean. He was very upfront, very honest. And he wasn't like overbearing, like, oh, that's my baby girl. It wasn't that vibe at all. But the questions he asked Orion were beautiful perfect questions and i was like you know what go ahead daddy i was so happy like let me okay go down to my notes because i have other stuff but it wasn't really a lot of stuff that happened mainly them talking about their family and you know who they miss talking to you know their husbands and wives new friends or whatever but her so first of all her father was happy to know that orion owns a toolbox because he always wanted a man that was kind of handy to be with his daughter so like that's fine and he asked Orion, are you planning on staying in Denver? And he was like, well, no. He was like, I've always wanted to relocate to the East Coast, at least own a house there, maybe own a house over there and here, because I just like to go around. I don't like to like be still, basically. And I, love, and I put this in my notes. Her father got him together and warned him that he needs to consider that it's not just him anymore, and he'll have to consider his wife and her needs and all of his decisions. Because when he said, oh, no, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do this, he didn't say, well, I'm hoping that I'll talk to Lauren and Lauren will be okay with, you know, getting a house on the East Coast and doing this and doing that. So like the father was like, okay, that sounds nice, but you're married now. So you may have wanted those things before you got married, but now you have a wife. And not saying you can't still have those things, but that's not a guarantee anymore because you need to talk to your wife. Is she on board with that? Would she want to relocate to the East Coast? She may not. But I love the fact that the father is trying to get him in that practice of considering somebody else. Because the show, as much as I love it for its entertainment value and for the lessons and all that stuff, it is very difficult, and I say this every season, it's very difficult to reprogram your mind from being single to being married. That process, there's no set timeline of how long that process should last, but it lasts a lot longer than the two weeks that they have. They're told on November, making up a date, November 2nd, hey, you're getting married. They are married by November 16th. Two weeks is not enough time to really start thinking about putting someone first, changing, again, changing your mindset from being single to being married. Because in that two-week span, you're having a bachelorette party, you're picking out your dress, you're buying the ring, you're telling your family and friends, you're doing all this stuff. So your mind is focused on all the surface level things. And maybe it's focused on, oh my gosh, what is he going to look like? What are we going to talk about? And blah, 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 blah. It's focused on all that stuff. And some of that stuff is important. Like I'm not going to, you know, downgrade it or anything, but you're not thinking about what it means to actually be married. You're thinking about the mayor, the wedding. Oh, I'm going to be a wife. This is going to be great. But you're not thinking like, oh, okay, wait a minute. Every time I went to the grocery store, I just bought stuff for me. Or my parents bought my stuff because I'm still living with my parents. Now, oh, wait a minute. I got to get stuff for him. Wait a minute. Does he have allergies? Oh, he's a vegan. Oh, he he's allergic to dairy. Oh, I got to change what I buy. That's a very small thing, but that is a huge, is a, a example of what it means to think about somebody else and to understand that it is no longer just you. And so I was glad that Lauren's dad kind of set Orion straight because again, he hasn't thought about that part yet because he just got married. But it's like, brother, like this is it's going to be big. You're going to have to talk to your chick and see what she says. And I liked that her father asked him specifically, what are his expectations of a marriage? And which I think is very, one thing he did say is that I, he grew up in a very matriarchal, uh, not society, but it's a matriarchal family where the women made all the decisions. And as a result of that, he doesn't want a woman telling him what to do. And it's like, okay, I can kind of understand that. But I feel like that needs to be, I feel like that needs to be discussed a little bit more, right? 
you don't like women telling you what to do, but does that mean that you don't listen to women when they talk? Does that mean that you want to be the only person having an opinion in the house? Or does that mean that you want a woman to be submissive? Like, what exactly does that mean? I feel like that needs to be a deeper conversation. Because Lauren seems like she's an alpha type female, or woman, I shouldn't say female, an alpha type woman. So that's a conversation that probably needs to be delved into a little bit more. And I'm sure it'll come up throughout the span of their marriage because everything always comes back up at some point. And... So, I mean, that was it for the conversation. And then everything else was just like, oh, uh, we had their first dance and it was awkward. She's never dated outside her race and he has never dated within his race, which I think is very interesting. Like, huh. For him, it's interesting. For her, it's like, I, I mean, because I personally never dated outside my race either. But the fact that he's never dated within his race is, I think, is kind of interesting. And I don't know if that goes back to him saying that women are, in his culture, are very vocal and I guess very controlling. I, I don't know if it has to do with that. But again, that's probably going to come up at some point later on. I'm almost positive it will. He lives at home with his mom because he's taking a class to be a real estate broker. She says she wasn't worried about that. Uh, he had some of his culture within the reception. He incorporated drumming. I thought that was cool. Everyone participated. His friends say that his nickname is Onion because he has a lot of layers and they asked her, is there anything about her that could possibly be a red flag for Ryan? And Lauren said, her personal red flag that sometimes she seeks too much validation. And I was like, hmm, okay. I think it's great that she understands what a red flag is. And she said it in a way that she knows it's something she needs to work on. But hopefully she that's something that she'll also express to her new husband now as well. Um... Yeah, I mean, I think that's interesting that she knows that about herself. And let's see, that was pretty much it. Like nothing really happened with them when it came to the conversation about sex that night. He does not want to have sex the first night. I don't think she made a comment either or. But when he was talking to his boys, he was like, I don't really want sex tonight. I want to just talk to my wife and get to know her. Okay, sure. And she also said that she thought Orion had a calming energy. So that's pretty much all that happened with them. Austin and Becca... I feel like out of all the couples, they have the most things in common. And just their energy, I feel like the chemistry, I see the chemistry in them more than I see in other people and other couples. So they're still my favorite couple right now. She told his friends that Austin is cute and that he seems really authentic. And both of them are very direct. Direct is something that can, think can be kind of objective. Direct could mean that you cut to the chase and you say what you mean. Direct could also mean that you say things without worrying about how the other person is going to interpret it. So direct can mean a couple different things. I don't know what direct means for them, and I'm sure we'll see the first time they have an argument because everybody's going to argue at some point. Normally, the honeymoon is when the first argument pops up. So we'll see what happens with that. Seems like she, well, she said that she's sex positive. She's not traditional at all. Uh, her friends told him that communication is key and that it needs to be direct, like I said. He had a roommate who was a woman, and the woman basically said that sometimes he starts projects, but he's not great at finishing them. So she was like, so make sure you stay on him about that, because he likes to start things and not be done with them, and that's not cool. So don't be afraid to speak up and say something about that. They got along really well. I liked that. I feel like with Becca's personality, I feel like it's very easy for her to get along with people. She seems like a very likable person. I will say that. And when it came to the conversation of sex, Austin said that he'll follow her lead tonight. And she said she wants to snuggle and kiss, but she said medically she's not ready for more. And I don't know if the wedding night is going to be the night where she finally talks about her medical issues with Austin. I feel like for something like that, that should be discussed sooner rather than later. So I'm going to assume that they'll talk about this in the next episode, but we'll see. Emily and Brennan, I feel like they're the most attractive looking couple. I got annoyed when Emily said, I do feel like a wife. It's been an hour. You know, like a wife, you feel like a bride because you wore a pretty dress and you walked down the aisle and now you're dancing and all that stuff. You don't feel like a wife, little girl. I shouldn't say little girl. She's 29, but still. I'm annoyed the fact that she's on the show. <laughs> I'm very annoyed. So I'm sure it's tainting my view of her. And so I'm going to... I'm going to try to write that in. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to write that in. She talked to him about her bachelorette party and how she was taking body shots off of strippers. Why is that necessary to talk about? It does seem like she's also 
direct and just kind of says what's on her mind. He finds it refreshing that she's so outgoing. I mean, I guess. The thing is with someone who is that young and quote-unquote outgoing, a lot of times they don't have a filter. And I feel like a filter, and I'll speak from someone who is older now, I think a filter is something you grow into. So I won't fault her for not having a filter right now at 29. I'm sure I didn't at 29 either. Probably in my 30s didn't have a filter. So it's something she'll definitely grow into. And it helps that he's 28. So his filter may be out of whack as well. Who knows? But I, I just thought that was kind of a weird thing to talk to your husband about, especially the day of the wedding. Why does he need to know that you were taking belly shots off of strippers? Like, why is that necessary? And again, this is the couple where I was fussing last time about how I feel like they're not having any meaningful conversation just yet. Like, this is what you choose to talk about. I don't even know if she knows this man's last name. They haven't had that discussion at all, at least not on camera. So I don't know. I don't know what that is. He said he's only been in a couple of relationships and his last one was two years ago. She's the one that's never been in any kind of serious relationship. And I had to think how many relationships have I been in? And I think... The definition of relationship differs from person to person. I will say for me, now mind you, I've been with my husband for 20 years. So he's one relationship. I think I've only had maybe four or five myself in all of my years. So not a lot. So I think being in a couple of relationships, especially at the age of 28, and I feel like his relationships probably last a little minute. I think that kind of checks out a little bit. His friends grilled her Even though they said that their first impressions were good, they seemed like, you know, she's bubbly, she's pretty, whatever, whatever, whatever. And they asked her specifically about, okay, we heard this is your first relationship. You know, what do you think about that? Why do you think that is? And she said she doesn't think it's a red flag. She said that not being in a relationship her entire life has given her 29 years to work on herself. That's one way of looking at it. And I didn't look at it from that angle. I mean, I guess... I still consider it kind of, I consider it a red flag, not in life. I consider it a red flag for being on this show. Maybe that should be the distinction. Being 29 years old and never been in a relationship is not necessarily an overwhelming red flag. It has given you a lot of time to work on yourself and to figure out who you are as a person. That's all well and true. So I think that that makes you a good candidate for eventually getting into a long-term relationship, but not getting married at first sight. I do think it's a red flag for this kind of process personally and that's still my opinion and I'm sticking with it so her friends said no his friends asked her what makes her think she's ready for this for marriage and she said no one really is and I actually agree with that I think as much as we as much as some people really want to be married really want to be a wife a husband or whatever There's no way to really prepare for it. I mean, there's things that you can do, but you never know what marriage is until you actually get into it. And there's no way to be 100% prepared, 100% ready for it. It's just, you know what? I love this person. I want to spend the rest of my life with this person. This is what I want. Hopefully it works out. If it doesn't, I don't know what I'm going to do. But the goal, obviously, is everyone, I'm assuming, everyone gets into marriage with the idea that this is going to be forever and this is going to be my person for the rest of my life. That's what we all hope for. And sometimes it works out that way and sometimes it doesn't. But that's one thing she said that I was like, you know what? I do agree with that. None of us are really ready for it, but all we can do is try and have good intentions. They warned her that communication is important to him. And her friend said that he needs to be patient with her because she's independent and hasn't had to think of others. And they were like, oh, we think she's definitely ready for this. A marriage is going to ground her. And it's like, (sighs) again, for this show... When you're diving headfirst into being a wife, that is difficult to, again, change your mindset from not having to think about others to now thinking about this man who is still technically a stranger. That doesn't happen overnight, and it doesn't even happen over two weeks. So I don't know if a marriage will ground her. I don't know if that's the... I don't believe that. That's my... I just don't believe that at all. She's down for sex for the first night. Um, you know, I think, you know, not surprised by that. But she says she'll follow his lead, but she did pack her handcuffs and whip just in case. I don't know. I think if I had to predict which couple is actually going to consummate on the first night of marriage, I think my money will probably be on Emily and Brennan. I don't see Austin and Becca. She said medically she's not ready, so I know they're not going to do it. Lauren and Orion, I don't see that happening. And Cameron and Claire, I don't see that either. I think she finds some funny. He finds her beautiful, blah, blah, blah. But I don't I don't see that happening with them at all. I, I just don't. I mean, at some point, maybe. But for the first night, 
maybe Emily and Brennan, if anybody. But I don't see anybody else doing it. And like I said, they didn't show Michael, but they did give us a sneak preview of next week's episode. And I told you guys in my last video that I heard a rumor that they might possibly be finding another bride for Michael. And so the previews for the next week's episode shows the experts talking to Michael and them saying, you know, well, there's been talk, you know, how would you feel about possibly having another bride and giving this another go? So of course they got to build up the drama and all this stuff. So I don't know what's going to happen with that. I don't know if he's actually going to get another bride. Are we going to see the whole process again of him actually walking down the aisle and having an actual marriage? Like, are we going to, I don't know what that's going to look like. But we'll see. But that was a review and recap of this week's episode of Married at First Sight, Season 17, Episode 3. I will be back in a few days to discuss Episode 4, which is coming out soon. Remember to like this video, share this video, subscribe to my channel, leave some comments below. Love again to my sorors. Love to all of my Scorpio sisters out there. Hope you guys have the most amazing day, and I will see you soon. Peace.